Okay, guys, it's 7.09 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, February the 9th, 2022 years from something. Today is probably just going to be single subject, and <clears throat> surprise, surprise, I may be bouncing around a lot. The subject is uh, pretty much going to be the... Uh, I want to choose my words carefully here. The the veneration of, or maybe sometimes the respect of, there's a whole broad ranging um, set of categories that you can put the um, lauding of Mr. A.H. into. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's really dry in here today. Sorry about that. So, you guys know who I'm talking about. And I, really, why am I doing this? It's, it's the algorithm. Um, Mr. Adolf. Because I mentioned this before. And, and as I said, I have associates. Um, and myself, me and myself, years ago, I, I absolutely defended him, his actions, I, I, uh, his party, um, what they did, their political uh, outlooks. I did the, the readings of that book, The Myth of German Villainy, uh, I, which I still think is an excellent book. I don't know if I agree with Bradbury's uh, conclusions on everything, though. And... Um, I would have to put far more time into this subject to give you, I think, a, a far better, crisper, clearer understanding on so many points and events that I'm, one, not able to. Secondly, I'm not willing to. Because you would literally have to be an expert in this because for one thing the information is not readily available there's a lot of bad information on this subject out there and um, I, I don't think that's on accident so I'm gonna go through some of the reasons why um, not, I'm not accusing him of necessarily being, you know, the bad guy. I'm not accusing him of being a Rothschild or anything like that. Not any of the, the, the sort of um, common accusations that a lot of us have heard. I'm just going to go over some uh, interesting things and talk based on my limited knowledge, give you my perspective, and then I'm going to make all of it, I think, extremely simple. And I'm not going to do that for starters because these things are they're important. Let's just, just look at them anyways. And then simplify. And I hope I don't I hope I don't miss anything. Okay. Um <clears throat> one one thing I, I do want to say that is one of my biggest problems is my people, Germans, Celts, these are the two people that I truly, uh, with all of my mind, believe are Israel and Judah. Israel. The covenant that was made with the forefathers after leaving Mitzram some time ago. That was perpetual, which I document in bringing it all together. It's perpetual. It's, it doesn't have an end that was ever articulated in the Bible. Um, we could say, we could possibly, we could speculate maybe when all things are fulfilled. All things haven't been fulfilled. 
And I still don't see that as an end to the covenant concerning keeping the law. And the specifics, staying in the land, being blessed, so on and so forth. Okay. Well, here's the problem. We have always had a tendency towards idolatry, whether that's idolizing our own, um, our forefathers, our heroes, and especially um, those of other peoples and other nations around us. Idolatry is a serious problem. Idolatry of our own figureheads is still idolatry. And you have to keep something in mind. The term that's used in the Bible, Aleyim, which in Masoretic Hebrew they pronounce it Elohim, this is a general term. Now, Yahweh is referred to many times as Aleyim, uh, but so are uh, men, leaders, principalities, also referred to as Aleyim. And the first commandment, we're not supposed to have any Aleyim, principalities, that we put before Yahweh. That's anything, any uh, creed, any persons, any um, philosophies, belief systems, political parties, worldviews. It covers all of it. Any of them. They are lesser aleim. They are lesser gods. And I know we tend to get a little bit bound up in this term gods because when we see that English word that's forced on top of aliyim so often the only time they don't force it on there is when they can't contextually then they have to change it to something more like rulers men judges check it H Strong's H430 so this has has to do with any sort of principle whatsoever that we're going to put before him and that's a serious problem and this will relate again towards the end so <clears throat> here's some of my problems these are the problems that I've been wrestling with concerning AH and I'm gonna be saying AH for the algorithm I'm probably going to be saying J's for the algorithm and everybody knows what I'm talking about when I say J's and yes I have to um, because sometimes J's is more appropriate because of the the convoluted terminology that's been forced on us too rather than just saying either Ash for Ashkenazim or Seph for Sephardim or even Miz as Mizrahi because there are a lot of various kinds I mean there's even there's even Yamini and I'm not sure if those are specifically Mizrahi because they're supposed to be Miz, Mizrahi are supposed to be Arabic Jays but the Arabs aren't all the same, okay? They're absolutely not. Those those Yemeni Jays that they flew into um, Palestine in the 40s, they were very different than, let's say, what you would call them as Ray Jews in, uh, in Egypt or in Iran. They're not all the same. And then you have Ethiopic, and I know there's <clears throat> debate on that, but... They exist. These are not the same race. These are people who might be united through a certain belief system, or what I would think is actually a, a sort of a belief system or more like a, a social political strategy that has been um, force fed to certain people, most specifically the Ash group, so that they would conform and comport to a certain image necessary and very useful to the people pulling all these strings. Um, so before AH even becomes somebody, anybody, we already have Vladimir Lenin, for instance, openly saying 
that uh, the way that they would control the opposition is by leading it themselves. You can't possibly believe if the Bolsheviks came to power, and yes, it's, it's pretty clear who was really leading the charge amongst the Bolsheviks, but again, these are capos. These weren't the guys at the top. You look at the financiers of these Ash, and they are going to, over and over again, strike you as Seth. Okay, So these were the on-site capos, but still. They had tried that revolution some decades earlier. So this wasn't a new thing. The idea of leading the opposition themselves was not a new thing. Um, this was something they articulated decades before, even in the protocols. Not a new idea. Ruling by deception, not a new idea. We have to keep that in mind. Okay? And... Uh, if everything was hunky-dory uh, in Weimar, which it wasn't, and they saw that, they, <clears throat> they understood that. They understood that there were going to be serious problems if Weimar continued. Weimar was maybe always meant to be temporary. And they were able to take control of a lot of things temporarily. Maybe they were able to do a lot of things they wanted to do as far as socially, um, and then let it go again, putting everything into the hands of um, a people's champion. Like I talked about in bringing it all together. <clears throat> this, is, this is an old thing. It's not a new thing. So we've got, Lenin's already saying that, and he didn't come up with that. He's just articulating a strategy. It just, he said it out loud. Now, what's weird is, these folks we're talking about, I don't know what their affinity with numbers is. I don't know what their affinity with specific numbers is. And I don't sit here and try to pretend that I understand when I see certain numbers over and over again um, concerning certain people or certain events or certain ideas that I know exactly what they mean. I don't. But we we certainly do see a lot of very interesting numbers <clears throat> when it comes to Mr. A.H. Uh, a lot of doubles, too. A lot of doubles. And then um, particular numbers that we'll see uh, folks in charge using over and over again. Now, it's said that uh, he was asked to and joined the DAP, which I guess it was known at the time as the DAP, September 12th, um, 1919, a double. Though I'm not absolutely positive if that was the 12th or the 11th, 9-11. And the reason that even matters is because four years later, he would lead what is either known as the Munich Putsch or maybe Hitler Putsch on 9-11-1923. Uh, we see 23 come up a lot in their symbolism too. I don't know what it means. I'm just saying we see it a lot. He was condemned or sentenced to prison on 11-11-23. Another double, 11-11. Um... That's really fast for somebody to even be tried and sentenced. That's that's pretty fast. Two months. I have sat in jail for for over thirteen months, going through these the, the ridiculous motions that the court system will put you through. I'm just saying it's that's fast. Um. It is said that by 1933, Mein Kampf sold 3 million copies. By 33, it had sold 3 million copies. And of course, um, Odd Birthday 420, which is also associated with other things like um, people use it as a, a drug term now, code, because a lot of people see it as like a national drug day. Um, 
That could be nothing. It could be something. Now, he did become chancellor in 1933, and he was 44. He was the 55th member of the DAP. Do all these things mean something? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. But there they are. It is very odd that he did have his records sealed. Um, now, I can't tell you because I'd have to look into it whether it was actually considered illegal or a crime to even look into or publish anything about his records as past during that time or not. Um, somebody who knows more about it would have to clarify. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, he was, f 33 on, a dictator. In a lot of ways, he could do anything he wanted, to a degree, and in some ways he did, absolutely did. Now, of course, it is said, said that he became that dictator through... Uh, a plebiscite, so it was the the majority will of the people speaking, um, and maybe that's true because they had had it so hard in Weimar, they would have pushed so hard by the time he came along because they would see this salvation, and that's exactly what they saw. Was that organic, or was it contrived? Of course they saw him as a savior and the party and the ideas. And they worked very well for some time until they worked so horribly, nightmarishly, not well, that it killed or ruined the seed line of uncountable amounts of Germans. And not only killed uncountable amounts of Germans in Germany, but abroad, those people participating in the war on the other side. Um, my grandfather fought in World War I, uncles in World War II, Germans, Germans and Irish. So, um, <clears throat> the th all right, so the funny thing about his records, you do have these people coming along and they try to say these, these things like he was a, a, a Rothschild. And, um, it, it, it's based on um, a speculation, maybe from like one person, a publication. That's what I got at least from, for instance, this, this document. Here, this is a small book. And this is, I'm going to say this is rather unorthodox, and I'm going to tell you why. There's this small book here that was um, copywritten in... 1999 by a guy named Alfred Condor and I'm going to give you a little bit on him and then tell you the, my issue with it. It was called The Untold Story of the Hitler Family or uh, A.H.'s Family Tree. Um, interestingly, they have a little thing on about the author Alfred Condor uh, has worked as a professional genealogist for the past 25 years. His research has taken him to most American states, Canada and the British Isles, and throughout Western Europe. Born in Kentucky in 1953, <clears throat> Alfred Condor is descended from Hans George Condor, who emigrated from the German Rhineland to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, on 27 September 1737, and a number of well-known historical figures, including King Edward III of England, ah, and Frederick uh, Barbarossa, Barbarossa of Hohenstaufen. Where's the Barbarossa come from? That was his surname. I know. I know of a. <clears throat> a well-known pirate with that name. The 12th century German emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, that Friedrich Barbarossa of Hohenstaufen. The 12th century German emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. That's, that's somebody to be descended from. If he came from the Rhineland, he did not come from the same uh, sort of poor, uh, meager estates that my ancestors would have came from in the Rhineland. Uh, Alfred Condor is the author of numerous books and articles on Christian church history. 
and currently resides in Washington State. <clears throat> However, he is a professional genealogist. He, he is publishing this through uh, somewhere in Salt Lake City, and just about every single publisher in Salt Lake City is Mormon or tied in with Mormon somehow. Uh, <laughs> that's a fact. So he has these genealogies from uh, European royalty. Again, see, bringing it all together. And um, he's a professional genealogist that obviously works with the Mormons. The Mormons um, are the database that's used for genealogy. Um, I think it's, what is it, genealogy.com? That's that big one, uh, which will definitely lead you to a number of uh, question marks and dead ends and whatnot. <clears throat> the biggest problem I have with this, because he purports to uh, trace uh, Mr. Adolf's family tree, the problem is this this whole work, which by the way, this book is 66 pages long. One of the biggest problems uh, here is that there's no there's there's no citations. There's no citations, there's no footnotes, there's no numbers or marks for a bibliography, so you can at least come back and check. There's none of that. He doesn't even cite some of the, uh, the first, because I wanted to use them, he made a few claims concerning the way that certain figures in history have changed history, and I thought, well, those are, those are juicy, I can, I can use those, but he doesn't even cite those, so I've got to go hunting if I want to confirm these not good. No citations. He gets down here into, he goes into a number of uh, genealogies of people that have been in the AH line. Again, he's not telling me uh, where the records are coming from, where they can be found, why I should believe them. Not at all. The best he's got is eight um, appendices at the end, which again, uh, most of those appendices are just expanding on little points that he made uh, throughout the course of this booklet. And again, even in the appendices, should he cite an author or somebody who said something, a lot of the times he doesn't even tell you the book, where they cited it in, give you the page number or anything like that. It's not good. <clears throat> and that's... I, I don't think that's... Um, Weird. I I think that's the norm with a lot of people who purport to um, be telling us these things. I, it's the same with this. Look, there's a guy. I was just kind of poking around a little bit, okay? There's this guy. His name is um, <clears throat> Weber, Thomas Weber. He wrote a book called Hitler's First War in which he says that he has gone into and found records um, that Hitler's service was not as, as brilliant as what people want to make it out, that he claims that a lot of that information actually came from um, extracts from Mein Kampf, which, you know, you, you have to have more than, you know, your own personal citations or claims to back something up. This is what he's claiming. I'm not claiming this. I'm just trying to tell you that if I were to get this book and read it, and he didn't have some pretty good citations. So I could go and check the source. I could see who wrote it. Um, I could see who published it. I could find out if there's any real meat to it. I would have a problem. But there are these claims. I mean, for instance, like he says in here, when, when he says that there was nobody ever heard A.H. say anything anti-Semitic or, or any of the things that we hear him saying once he joined, you know, DAP, NSDAP. Almost like he had changed his persona from the way people knew him then till a few years later. All right. Now, I think it is, it is bizarre that he and the others in the DAP were huge advocates of the stab in the back theory. I'm not going to go that into it, but most would know the no most would know the general specifics of the stab in the back theory. 
he was one of the big proponents of that theory, as were the others in the uh, DAP. Yet he allowed this enormous amount of J's, and we have to figure probably mostly Osh, unless we're talking about um, officers, which he had those too. Could have been Sefs, could have been Ash. Why? so many in the military if you so firmly believed in that stab in the back. Same thing with the state propaganda being from various newspapers. We can talk about like, uh, or just think about the works of Al, uh, Alfred, um, um, come on, Rosenbaum, um, Eric and Matilda, um, Ludovic, what is their last name? These these are people who were um, the propaganda machine, big part of the propaganda machine. The thing is, these people were highly educated, yet they, in their propaganda, and, you know, Goebbels, they all pushed a lot of sort of ridiculous tropes. For one thing, and, and in those films like the um, um, the Eternal J, it did. It, it, there were some things about it that were just so obvious, obviously stereotypical and ridiculous, where somebody from the outside might look at this and go, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that's that's just blatant, silly propaganda. In some ways, not in all, you can't. Of course, you can't, you know, the whole thing can't just be lies, but the whole thing is not truth. None of these guys that I've read so far um, differentiate between types of J's, literally different races, the Seth, Ash, Miz, and the sub races within the, the Ms. Ray. You know, and honestly, I'm prone to thinking that there are some tribes of them dotted um, throughout Eastern Europe too that might not even identify as either of those. Like, for instance, the um, the the Romaniotes. They didn't identify as Ash or Seth. There's another one. They aren't the same people. Sometimes there's a crossover if they interbreed and so on and so forth because a lot of them have the same goals in a lot of ways. But they're not racially the same people kind. A lot of them, and especially the, the, the Seth from the others, Sephardim are absolutely white people. Indistinguishable from just about any other European. Which is how they've been invisible all this time. Um, you know, and just the weird things about masonry being outlawed, which again could be optics. A lot of this, you got optics isn't a new thing. Is it, optics isn't something that Trump started or Bush started or Reagan started. It's not new. It's been going on for a long time. People who are deceiving, people who are ruling the world through deception, they count on optics. And they would have had to for, for the longest time. You know, you get you get rid of Masons. You speak against, the, you know, the Jays and the Masons, but you have Masons that are holding important government offices still. It's weird. It's just weird. Um, Dunkirk. Not just Dunkirk. The sheer amount of time that cities with Germans in them were allowed to be bombed before any reciprocity. Uh, personally, I find that absolutely unacceptable. I know. Listen, I know what the, uh, the replies are. I do. I wouldn't be talking about these things if I didn't understand the re responses. Or the justifications. Well, you know, this happened.
because of this. He he didn't want this this full scale huge war, so he allowed this and he allowed this and he allowed this and he allowed this. And I know he looks very much like um, somebody just bending over backwards, trying for peace, 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 peace. But in the meantime, there were Germans dying like crazy between the the German deaths in Poland, um, the ones separated in in Danzig, which would be part of Poland. Uh, all of the Germans in German cities that were being bombed and killed. I know I'm just I know I'm just a little guy sitting in front of my computer here in the middle of America. What do I know? Right? What do I know? I would never allow that. I'd make it clear, all I wanted was peace. Did not want war in any way, shape, and form. I, I really did not want war, but there's no way I'm letting anyone, whether I believe them to be kin, and yeah, a lot of English were kin, and we're going to see part of the reason why here soon they were. Not, not just the idea of the Anglo-Saxons and but there's more to it than that. They were kin. That's true. There's a lot of ways you could have handled Dunkirk other than letting them go. You could have treated them like kin, but not let them go. And even if it's kin, you have to tell them, I'm not letting you come in here and bomb my people or kill my people. It's not going to happen. What do I know? Stalingrad seems to be handled terribly. I know, I know, I know there's arguments. There's arguments over all of this stuff, which is why I'm going to simplify it. A couple more points and we're going to simplify. <sighs> Suicide in a bunker. While there's little children barely teenage children running around with guns that are going to defend their people. They're going to defend their moms and their sisters from the allies. They're running around out there. You're going to commit suicide in a bunker. Why? What's the rationale? He didn't want the allies or the Jays or the communists to get a hold of his body and do what they did to Mussolini's body. Is that what it is? Would that have been the excuse? Okay. Again, what do I know? I'm just some idiot from the Midwest, right? My women, my racial kinsmen, and women and children, and men, whoever, my racial kinsmen, are in this place and the enemy's coming up the road and a lot of them weren't my racial kins they certainly weren't led by my kinsmen and even if they were they were an aggressor against what kin I had and I'm gonna sit in a bunker safe kill myself? Really? And that's just the mainstream story. A lot of theories. A lot of theories. Um, you know, where's the corpus delecti? Where's the body? All right. So, um, funny, too, um, the stand that they took on the Jays compared to um, really how excellently they were treated. For a while there, um, being treated better and fed better than German citizens. Uh, well, he had to worry about what the world thought. 
Did he? Did he? He didn't have on his um, big boy pants that told him that it didn't matter how good or how bad he treated them. The international press was lying about him. So what, again, was the incentive and the motive? If they won, it wouldn't matter what the world or the international press tried to accuse him of. If they lost, they would have... They would accuse them of anything they wanted to, and they would write history any way they wanted to, which they did. He treated them remarkably well. In contrast to a lot of what he said about them. Okay. Uh, and then there's this. We're going to take a look at a little piece of a presentation that the Flat Fact Channel did called Orphans of Operation Pied Piper. Uh, I will put a link in the description to this and we're only going to see a couple of little chunks but it's going to tell us a lot actually. Oh yes and one thing briefly before I start this keep in mind that the biggest uh, operation in order to rewrite history that we know of in America <clears throat> were what's called the orphan trains separating children from their parents and re-educating them transplanting them re-educating them this isn't just done with us this is done a lot it's kept very secret because it's clandestine they can't publish that's what they do or we'd be on to them that's what they do it's how you change history you the way you change history is Yes, you contrive new, spurious, false information, and you just teach that to children who don't know any better. You have to separate them from the past, which is separating them from their parents and from their people. This is how you successfully rewrite history. I'm going to show you two quick clips from this video that Flat Fact did to illustrate something that is bizarre and deserves an answer. I don't necessarily have the answers for you. I, you know, theoretically, I believe it's because we need to seriously question the sincerity of Mr. Adolf and his cohort, his whole party, all the people at the top, folks with names like, for instance, Hess, Rudolf Hess. You know, keep in mind that before Germany became a a defined geographical and so-called defined ethnic state. It was run by barons and landlords, same as, as a lot of the countries that our forefathers dwelt in as peasants or slaves. Um, two of those um, large duchies, I guess I'll call them for now, were Hess. Two of them. Um, and so what? One of his, his top main guys, Hess. Um, sounds to me a lot like Alger Hiss. His family had changed their name from Hess. And a lot of you know who Alger Hiss and that he was a communist spy and so on and so forth. That was his, like, that was A.H.'s right-hand man, Rudolf Hess. And the specifics of his dropping into the Midlands or Scotland and being taken captive and no one really ever saw him all that time. Did it happen? Did it not happen? Was he ever really there? I don't know. I don't know. So let's take a look at a couple of little clips from this. To live under the same roof as their parents. Some of these children will never see their parents again. Don't let them take your children. How long will two sets of clothing last? Note here that the same three-day evacuation of the children scenario also happened in Germany. Right, so this was an operation. <clears throat> You'll see if you watch the whole video. This was an operation that started in the 30s in England. It had been planned for, that we know of, eight years. 
And the bizarre thing is the, the very same operation, type of operation, specifics, same character, look, the same end goals is being done in Germany at the same time under Mr. A.H. Of the government's choosing to stay in homes with unknown people. The mothers lined up in droves, filled in the forms, signed the paperwork, labelled their children and kissed them goodbye. Do you think the general public of Britain had any idea that Operation Pied Piper had been in the planning for some eight years? Of course not. The general public is not privy to military operations. Now let's have a look at the child evacuation scheme in Germany. And please, ladies and gentlemen, let us notice the similarities between the British and German taking of the children, keeping in mind that we know Britain started planning Operation Pied Piper eight years before the war. The German government's military operation was called Kinder Transport. Quote, Fearing that the war would result in mass civilian deaths and affect its future generations, the German government under the leadership of Adolf Hitler ordered that the children and mothers with infants be evacuated to rural locations and other parts of the country which were considered safer. The evacuation exercise happened in numerous phases. It is estimated that the first phase of children evacuation that happened over a three-day period saw more than 800,000 children evacuees relocated by special trains and boats to the locations considered to be safe such as Saxony, Bavaria and Prussia. It is estimated that around 2.5 million children in Germany were removed under orders from Adolf Hitler. Surprisingly, many of these children from Germany were transported to Britain. David Attenborough of documentary fame in 1938 had children from Germany stay with his family when he was a child. Interesting. <clears throat> yeah, really interesting. Of course, this is one of the reasons that I haven't gone too much um, into surnames because there are <clears throat> a lot of Germans and, and Israel. I'm sorry, it's so dry in here. I got to get a, a pot of water going. Um, there are a lot of Germans and Irish, which made up the great, absolute great bulk majority of children on those orphan trains for 75 years from the 1850s to the 1920s. In America, mostly Germans and Irish, they ended up with other families that weren't specifically German and Irish, different last names, and they inherited those. So, you know, you could be running around out there and you could have the name of somebody who's absolutely not our racial kinsman because there were just so many, especially in the Midwest. Um, New York State led the way because a lot of them were just shipped off into rural areas of New York State and then Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan. And then, you know, Kentucky and Tennessee, like this whole Midwest area. Interestingly enough, planting us all back in all of the areas that I theorize are the areas that would have made up Canaan in the first place, all the way to the coast. They didn't have to transplant them to the coast. There was already enough of us over that way. So there's that. That's how you rewrite history. It's how you change history. It's how you can take a people <clears throat> from their homeland, from their native soil, and in just a very, very few short centuries, completely re-educate them, rule them by deception and make them, for instance, think it's been 2,000 years since even the life of Christ. 
when I would say everything I've seen tells me that it was not more than a few brief centuries. So, how do I simplify this whole thing? Because we can, and they have argued over A.H. and his party and their politics uh, for a long time, and they could keep doing it. it. It works very well for them to keep up that debate, just ad nauseum forever. And no matter which side of the debate you come out on, it works very well for them. Why? Well, because pretty much most of these people doing this are the same as, if not abs the same, as the Jacobins that I mentioned um, a few episodes ago. The Jacobins. In what way? Well, <clears throat> if you're here in America, they might uh, go on ad nauseum about the Constitution, being Christians and the Constitution, or if you live anywhere, because there's essentially a Constitution that's not that much different than the American Constitution, just about everywhere that you probably live. Constitution, Constitution, Constitution. And you know, I think Lysander Spooner articulated very well why and how it is that the Constitution was never meant for us. It was meant for the people running things. So these Jacobins will convince you of the great veracity of the Constitution or some other political party, some other ideology, National Socialism, that's superior. That's our model. That's what we should go with. That's what they're going to say. They'll uphold the Constitution of the United States or any other Constitution that seems good or National Socialism. Their goal is to keep us from pursuing the knowledge we once had and lost. The specifications that Yahweh gave our forefathers as part of the covenant of us keeping his law, statutes, and judgments, and us staying in the land he gave to our forefathers in perpetuity and being blessed. Good lives, good health, longevity, peace. So they will they'll preach any kind of system that seems good as long as it's not specifically us abandoning those other systems paying attention to a lot of the problems with the world that's the other thing you have to remember is the national socialists the the leading academics and the the party itself and thus the state they absolutely backed up all of the establishment um, narratives concerning establishment history, establishment pseudoscience. And I know a lot of people make cases for them, well, they were, they were good in this way, or, or they were good in that way, they were much better in this way and that way, and it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's just splitting hairs. Here's how we know he and they weren't good for Germany, the people of Germany, and how we were misled. When a people is righteous, when a people is lawful, and when a people is obedient, as we see in the Bible, they don't lose the way that Germany lost. When they're righteous and obedient, they win, they succeed, they prosper. This isn't a roll of the dice. This isn't like a lot of people want to teach you today that, well, who can know and, you know, just keep your head down, be a good little boy, and you can look forward to heaven. This isn't like that. If we read the bulk of the scriptures, 
we can see that when a people is righteous before Yahweh, and when they are striving, they don't always have to be perfect. Keep that in mind. They have to be striving to be obedient, do the best they can. There were, there had been ages when nobody in the in the land had even read the law, knew what the law said. Ages. King Hezekiah, he had no idea what the, the specifics of the law were, and he knew how to read the original language. He didn't have to deal with this Masoretic garbage and, and the, the, the translational garbage and all the other. He didn't have to do that. He knew exactly what it said. But it had been ages since anyone had, had read it, had kept it. We were absolutely lawless for ages. And Hezekiah simply, he made it a point that they were going to get the law back out. They were going to concentrate on it and do their best simply to obey it the best they could. They didn't have a lot of time that they could try to re-understand it and implement those things because they were about to be smashed by Assyria, Asher. But he made a commitment that Judah was his kingdom Judah was going to be a lawful people, and he was going to do everything he could to be obedient to Yahweh as best as he could understand, and the law is lengthy. And he did that, and Yahweh defeated Asher. Killed 185,000 of their men, and that wasn't all their men. That had surrounded Jerusalem. This is a pattern. When the people are righteous, thus their hearts are turned in the right direction, they don't lose the way Germany lost. And a lot of you know how bad, degrading, and horrific that was. So those people, whether A.H. and the others, were absolutely sincere or utterly criminal. Either way, they did not lead their people in the paths of righteousness and they cost my people countless lives. Countless minds were broken. Countless little bodies were broken, burnt, destroyed, bloodlines eradicated. So, no matter if he was a, a great guy or not, based on, I guess, a certain criteria, I will not laud him. And I will continue to question his motives because I think there is a great deal of material and I think very objective evidence that should cause any of us who care about the common people of Germany, um, if you're like me, German and Irish, the Germans, the Germanics, the Celts, if you care about the people and not the ideas of their leaders, then there's plenty there to question. So with that, I'm at almost an hour. I'll wrap it up for the day. See you next time.